are still to be done in this city. Greater things are yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. Through the Lord of creation, the creator of all things, you're the king of all, all kings, you are. You're the strength and the weakness, you're the love to the broken, you're the joy and the sadness, you are. And there is no one like us. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things are yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things. Greater things are yet to come. Greater are still to be done in this city. Greater things are yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Shines, glory shines from hearts alive. Praise for you and love for you in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done here. Cause there is no one. While we were singing that, I just kept hearing that verse. I, I don't know if this is resonating with you or not this morning. And you, how many believe that there's more things to be done in this city? Amen. Honestly. Amen. Amen. I'd like to see you a little more excited about that. Not trying to be harsh. Amen. If you really think there's more to be done, I think we ought to get a little more excited about that. But can we take it one step deeper? How many remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14? He said, you, turn to your neighbor and point at him and say, you, a city set on a hill. Now think about this song. Greater things are yet to come. 
greater things are still to be done in this city. Lay your hand on your chest right now, if you would, and start singing this song with us again. Let's sing through that one more time, if you would. Greater things are yet to come. I want to read it to you out of the message version real quick. It said, here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in this world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Amen. Come on, sing it. The greater things are still to be done in this city. still to be done in this city. Sing that out, greater things. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come. Greater are still to be done here. Yes, amen. There is no, there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. There Father, I thank you today for the truth that there is no one like our God. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence that's in this place, each one of us individually and corporately today. We just give you praise. We thank you that there are greater things yet to be done, that you're not finished with us yet. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your blessing. We give you glory today. Would you mind to do that song when we come back after the word today I just really feel we need to get into this but I do want you to come back you'll understand why in a little bit Noah would you mind to help me move that desk We'll let the kids be dismissed to Children's Church. And let them run. <clears throat> hey Amen. It's a good day. I mean, he's excited and expecting it to be a good day. Me too. Well, I want to get back into the Word. I want to get back into uh, where we left off a couple weeks ago. First of all, I need to thank Kerrigan um, for doing such an awesome job last week. Amen. Did you give her a hand? Very timely word. 
It's a little too short, but <laughs> no. we were watching along there, and she went to close, and I looked at Cassie, and I said, oh, my, I hope Lynette back there with the kids is ready for this. <laughs> it was an awesome word. How many know sometimes it doesn't take a long time to say what you need to say? Some of us just take longer to get it out. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep it short today, less than two hours, so bear with me. I didn't get to really preach last week, so we'll make up for it. If you have your Bibles, get them out if you would. Go to the book of Genesis. We're going to be back in our story in Genesis of Isaac. Um, and uh, a couple weeks ago, I started in a particular story in the Scripture, and I really believe the Lord touched me to talk about uh, this for a few weeks, and last week I think I, I told you I kind of titled it WWW, or another way to put it would be Three Wells, because I want to talk about three particular wells that um, God really dealt with me personally and corporately, I believe, in the church in general in this day and time, not just our church, but I think it's a time that the church the, as a whole redigs some wells. Amen? And uh, I'll try to explain why a little further as we, uh, a little more as we go. But so I want to continue for a little while today in this and see how far we get. Hopefully I'll finish uh, recapping the first one just a little bit and get to the second one and get through that. Um, and then we'll deal with the other one next week probably also. Um, well, I'll deal with that later too. Um, today is Reformation Sunday. You might say, what is Reformation Sunday? Um, it is the Sunday where we celebra celebrate the Reformation of the church. And uh, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, and I want to I read his quote. He said, let us celebrate the truths that make us free. The just shall live by faith. Amen. It's not of works, it's by faith. The priesthood of every believer. Salvation by grace through faith and so many more. Thankful for the pioneers who risked life and limb for the truth. And let us continue the legacy of the Reformation. Amen. How many are thankful for our fathers of faith that went before us all those years ago that risked reputation, life, limb, and everything else because the truth was so important to them for people to know it was more important than life itself because they wanted people to be free. Amen. Also forgot a birthday, Matt, sitting back here. Happy birthday to Matt also. Anyway, so I want to recap the scripture. If you would uh, pull those up for me, if you would, uh, Spencer. I'm thankful for those guys back there as well. I need to say that once in a while again, too, um, for all that they do back there. The, the tech team at this church does a phenomenal job, and we are thankful for them. Amen? So let's pray, and then we'll get into this. Father, one more time, I ask you to anoint me. I ask you to flow through me today. Let us hear you and not me. Holy Spirit, guide and direct each word that comes out of my mouth today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O oh God. I thank you that your word is life-giving. It is like a well springing up within us. And I give you praise for it today that it will accomplish what you sent it to. And we give you praise. Amen. Genesis chapter 26, starting in verse 1, says, And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. There again, our fathers of the faith. How many know and realize that God will make promises and covenants and say words or tell things to our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents that will come to pass maybe in our generation? And God always honors his word. If God said something to someone, how many know it is coming to pass? Because he's the God who was and is and is to come. He's already there. And when he, when he declares something, it's as, as if it's already happened because he said it. How many know when God speaks, things begin to shift and move, period? 
That's all there is to it. God speaks. In the beginning, God spoke, and everything began to shift and move and to go into place. The earth and water began to form, to, 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 to go into places only, and, and mountains begin. And all the things that God did, it all is based on His Word. Amen? I'm thankful for those who prayed for me. We wouldn't be at this church. We wouldn't live in this town if it wasn't for Faye Goble, who was a woman in Phillipsburg when I was a baby. We left Phillipsburg when I was a year old, but for the first year when mom had to have a babysitter, she would send me to Faye Goble, which is Mike Hughes' aunt, by the way, for those of you that might remember Mike. And, and I would, I would, mom would take me there, and she would hold me in her lap, and she would pray over me and declare the Word of God over my life. And I, I, I had conversations with her, and tears would run down her face when she told me what she prayed over me as a baby and what she spoke over me and what God told her about me because God would tell her what He had to say about me, and she would declare it over me. And it's because she was here that we ever came to, try, came to preach the first time. We did it as a favor to Fay. And when I walked in the door, God said, I want you to be here. And I said, no, you don't. I'm here as a favor. How many know I didn't know who had prayed and what deal God had made with somebody else a long time ago? Amen. That's how it is with you and I. We don't really get a choice sometimes. Amen. People don't like to hear that. But if you've got a praying mama, a praying dad, or you are a praying mom or dad or grandparent or somebody in somebody's life, you need to understand the power of the Word of God. When God speaks to you about your child or about your grandchild, come hell or high water, whatever he said's coming to pass, and you might as well say what he said over them. Amen? I might get fired up today. I give you all these lands. And I'll perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. In other words, you're going to do it anyway because I made a deal with your dad. And I'll make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. And I'll give to you, your descendants, all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because. Everybody say, because. I feel the Holy Ghost. Abraham obeyed my voice and he kept my charge and my commandments and my statutes and my laws. And we talked about this last week that we're 430 years. Abraham was 430 years before the law was ever given. So it's not the Ten Commandments laws that he was talking about. It was just a man who walked by faith and listened to the Word of God. And whatever God told him to do, that's what he did. Amen? I mean, that's pretty simple. Sounds simple. Until he tells you to do something you don't want to do like I want you to be here. Come on. Wake up and be with me today. Next verse. Go ahead. One more. And so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Now, we've been studying on Wednesday night about Abraham as well, but we're in a different chapter. We're back in chapter 12 and uh, 11, 11, 12 area of, of the story of Abraham and things going on in his life. But what I want to remind you of is in both of these stories, they were in a place called Gerar. They were in a city called Gerar. The word Gerar, it literally means a dry place, a hard place. If you go back with me to uh, chapter 11 of Genesis and, and, and the end of chapter 11, you're dealing with Abraham and his father, and they were dwelling in a place called Gerar. Abraham had been, Abraham's father had left obeying God to go to Canaan, the same promised land that Abraham was headed to, but he got to a place called Gerar and he stopped. And we've been dealing with that on Wednesday nights. If you haven't been watching that, you ought to go back. It'll help understand where we're going to tie some of this together today. But he stops in this dry place or in this hard place. And he stays there till he dies. And I thought, how sad that he stayed there. He didn't just keep going. And so after Abram, Abram's father dies, his name was still Abram back then. After his father dies, he, 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 the, the, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, that God had said, that means he's already said it. He said, leave this place and leave, leave where you're at, your kindred, your country, these things that are familiar, and go to a place that I will show you. How many know God wants us all to go on a journey? The Abrahamic covenant, Cassie's teaching your kids about covenants on Wednesday nights, and the Abrahamic covenant is the closest one to the new covenant that we have. And he, he wants to take us on a journey. He wants to take us to a promised land, not a place in heaven someday only. I do believe in heaven someday. But I, I, I believe that there is a promised land, a place of dwelling, and it is in Christ Jesus is the land. How many know Jesus is the promised land? Living in Christ, living in the Spirit of God, of following that life in Christ is the promised land. 
There is no lack in that place. There is no, there is no tears in that place. It is, it is what we've referred to someday over here as heaven somewhere. How many know you could have it as the days of heaven on earth is what God told them in the Old Testament he wanted to give them then? I got to calm down or I'm going to get sweaty. So on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about not stopping in our journey and the importance it is as a parent to follow what God has for you because it's not just about you. It's not just about me. It's about my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. God convicted me to pray over all of them every time I pray. I declare things over my children and my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, because God is such a generational God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and we talked about, I don't know if I mentioned it here uh, the last Sunday that I preached or on Wednesday night, that it is a biblical fact that by the third generation, biblically, most wealth and power is squandered. And I could take you through story after story in Scripture how it's squandered by the third generation except Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that line there, that the, the father would be a, ser a servant to God, might be a priest or something to God. But by the second and third generation, and we discussed that on Wednesday night, so I'm not going to redo that here. But it's powerful, and we don't have to let it get that way. We don't, have to, we don't have to let it be squandered by the third generation. All the things that they worked for and they, they strove for and they accomplished in their life, we don't need as a second and third generation to let that go. We need to redig some wells that they were drinking from and do some principal things in our life that they had. Amen? And that's what made them successful, and that's what, what will keep the success. Physically, spiritually, financially, whatever it is, how many know there's a reason that people succeed? Stay with me. A well without water in Scripture almost always became a prison. A well without water in Scripture almost always was a prison. Remember Joseph? Where'd they throw him? They throw him in a well, a well without water in it. They just threw him in a well, it became a prison. And I could go through thing after thing, and for the sake of time, because I'm already behind about 10 minutes here, but... <laughs> It becomes a prison. Don't allow the wells without water that the enemy has filled up. Let's go back and continue on those verses. Skip on down to uh, the next set I gave you. I'm going to skip on down to 12 from, from verse 6 here just for the sake of time. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. I'm, that's the wrong chapter. We need 16, not 6. I talked about Gerard being a dry place. You ever felt like we were in a dry place? You ever been in a dry place spiritually? It just doesn't feel like the Spirit of God's moving in your life or there's a flow near as much or uh, even in our country today. One of the things that's happened through COVID and since the COVID uh, fiasco, the deal of shutting people in their homes and, and everything stopping and coming to a standstill, it interrupted not only our daily lives and, and, and the uh, the, the, the cycles that we were in, but it also disrupted everything in the, in, in the uh, distribution areas of everything. And we're just now seeing the fallout of that. I said this a year ago. The real thing has not hit a year ago. The real problem is when the repercussion of what happened hits. And this is what we're dealing with now. And, and, but one of the things that happened is it just feel, felt like, I don't know if you're this way, maybe it's just me, but it just felt like you don't even know, really know what to do or what to pursue anymore. It's like, and, and, and I'm not a super big on the American dream as the way we've uh, made it out to be necessarily, but I do believe in the dream of life and living out a life fulfilling that God has for us in whatever way, shape, and form. Amen? But with that comes that, 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 that fear or that hesitation to move forward in whatever we're doing because you do, you especially if you focus on the news and you listen to a lot of the stuff that's going on worldwide, it makes you second guess or hesitate as far as what you want to do. Is it really worth pouring into this or not? Is this ever going to last? I mean, what's this economy going to do? We don't know which things are really going to make it or not and, and those kinds of things. And it causes us to, 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 to stop in a dry place or stop and maybe hesitate. But God doesn't want us to stop in those places. Will we go through them? Absolutely. 
Will we go through dry places in our marriage to where it just doesn't seem like the fire's there like it used to be? Absolutely. If you don't think so, get married and try it for a while. Amen? Doesn't mean you're bad. Doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's just life. And we can get caught up. We get busy. And we kind of let, let the fire go out in different ways or, 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 or forms. It's that way in our businesses. You can kind of do something so long and then it just kind of gets mundane or you get lax with it. I can do, we can do it in ministry the same way. How many, how many know that you can get so used to what you've got, you forget what you've got? You'll take for granted what you've got. And this is what I'm, I feel like God is, is, is dealing with me about the church in general and, and that we've got to get back to digging some wells and redigging some wells and realizing the source of water and the source of life that he has for us if we will redig them. And it says, then Isaac sowed in that land. Remember, this is a dry place. There was a famine. Things were hard, didn't know what to do, didn't know where to sow, didn't know what to, what to sow into. And, of course, they're talking physical crops here. But it says that Isaac sowed into that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. I mean, you know what the Bible says that the seed is? The Word. We got onto this about the first well being the well of the Word a couple of weeks ago. He sowed. How many know if you and I would sow the Word in the dry place, it'll reap a hundredfold because it's the Word of God. Some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. But the Word of God sowed in a dry place, it'll bring a hundredfold. He sowed that. And so recapping last week just a little bit there. Go ahead. And the man began to prosper because he sowed the Word in a dry place. The principles of the Word. The principles of the Word for your marriage. The principles of the Word for your finances. Uh, it, that. The principle of the word for how you raise your kids, the principles of the word, the truth of the word, you sow that into those dry places when things aren't working and things don't seem to be going right or at a standstill, it will, it will just begin to prosper and it will cause a hundredfold return. The problem is we don't really sow the word. The problem is we don't really sow the finances. The problem is we really don't sow the time. I'm getting ahead of myself. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great number of servants. God is not afraid of you and I having stuff. Amen? It's his good pleasure, your Bible says, to bless and prosper you. God wants you to be blessed and prospered. What he doesn't want you to do is have the blessings and the, prosper, the prospering to have you. He wants to have you. Amen? For he had possessions of flocks possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines, Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. And then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and he dwelt there. He had to leave the city of Gerar, and he went to the valley of Gerar, is what that would be like. It'd be like leaving out of the city and just kind of getting outside of the town. You're still in that area of a dry place. You're still in there because you, you begin to sow into your life, the Word of God into your life, and people begin to envy you. It begin to cause contention and strife, and I'm going to get back into that in a minute. And so they wanted him to leave, and so he, he, they're, they're like, get away from me. And so he, he, he goes just a little ways away from them, and he camps there again. I gotta, I'm trying to skip some stuff for the sake of time. I think it was Yvonne posted last week in the, or a couple of weeks ago in the live chat about sowing in the dry places, a, 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 a phrase that's been said, sow in the dust and your bins will bust. I thought, what a, what a word for the word of God, sowing in a dry place and a hundredfold return. How many would like to have a hundredfold return on your crops? You'd like a hundredfold return on your cattle? on your money, on everything. So into in your life, your marriage, your happiness, your health, the, the, the Word of God is still true. The principle is still there. If we wait to prepare until the opportunity arises, it will be too late. And then Isaac departed from there, and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. He's still in a dry place. He's still in a time of famine. And Isaac, the Bible says, dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham 
and he called them by the names which his father had called them. Back up one verse, if you would. I want to stay here for a minute. The Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. I'm going to, I want you to replace the word Abraham with faith because Abraham is our father of faith. Amen? And we talked about this just a little bit a couple weeks ago. When faith dies, the enemy tries to come in and begin to fill our wells with dirt, with earth, with flesh, with distractions, with whatever. When your faith begins to die and you wonder when, when what you thought God was doing doesn't happen or, or what, you, what you believe to be true doesn't come to pass, when you think it comes to pass, it's easy to find yourself in a dry place and it's easy for us to get distracted and where those wells that we're going to be talking about, one being the Word, begins to get filled up with earth. And we talked about this last week about how, how hard it is sometimes to spend time in the Word of God. And when you're going through a really difficult time and it's hard, it's really hard to open your word up and, and get anything out of it. But it doesn't mean that we don't keep digging. It doesn't mean that we quit. The word is still the word and the truth is still the truth. And, and so I understand that part. But it says that he called them by the names which his father had called them. There's a message right here. I, so much of this I want to stop and preach. I told you this a couple weeks ago. I want you to be reading this chapter over and over because it is just chock full of all kinds of, of, of good content. We call things what they are and stop trying to change the names and the meanings of names. How many can see that in our culture right now? It is a huge thing. It is a, a massive move to try to, to, to rename everything and change the meanings of names and words from what they used to be. I don't know about you, but we need to quit worrying. <laughs> we need to quit changing the names of syrup and football teams and stupid stuff like that and quit worrying about trying to say, oh, that meant something else when it didn't mean that at all. Amen. We didn't mean anything bad by what we said. We just called it that, and that's what it was. How many know syrup is syrup, and a ball team's a ball team? It has nothing to do with whether it's got an Indian head on it or a hatchet or anything else. Amen? It's just a ball team, but they use those kinds of things, and then and they, and they drift over into other things to where they, they don't want to call a, a, a dad or a father a father and a mother. We're going to change that to where it's uh, something. They want to call a man a man. They want to call a woman a woman. They, they begin to change the names. It's time that we as the church, it's time as we as an individuals get back to calling things what God calls them. Amen. We need to get back to calling things what God said they are. God says something about something, and that's the way it is. It doesn't change just because we didn't like it or it offended us or because we were doing something we didn't want to be called out on. What's that guy, Joe Rogan? Is that his name? I heard him say something the other day. He said when people, when people um, uh, say something just off the wall about you, just so ridiculous about you, and it's not true, it doesn't really bother you. You can just kind of let it roll off because you're like, I can't believe they're that stupid. I mean, that's just that's ridiculous. But he said how you know that it's partly true is when it makes you mad. Let that set there for a second. You'll get it in a minute. How you know when they say something bad about you or say something terrible about you, if it makes you mad, that's a good indication that it's partly true. Because otherwise it wouldn't even make you mad because it's just so ridiculous. It's like, wow, that's just stupid. But everybody trying to change the names and meanings of stuff, I, I get that we might not have understood some things even in Scripture. And that, it, that as we study and we move forward in some revelation and under, understanding of what things mean and the meanings of words and towns and names and things like that, uh, it should always add to the truth but not take away from the truth. Amen? We need to call it what it is. A couple of weeks ago we talked about the word. First thing we need, especially in dry times, and living in Gerar is we need a word. We need a word from God. We need the written word of God. We need the, the spoken word of God. We need a revelation of the word of God. And here's the deal. Go ahead. Can I go back to those verses and let's go a little farther. 
That clock says I've got 35 minutes. I want to double that. And Isaac dug again the wells in which he had dug in the days of Abraham his father for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham or faith. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Well, number one was the, herd, the word. Watch this. But the herdsmen, this is just what God told me to share as a word. I'm not saying that this is a revelation. I can prove it, all this. What I'm saying is God told me to talk about three wells, and he said, I want you to talk about this, this, and this, and in this order. So hear my heart today. This is what he just dealt with me about. But it said, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, this water's ours. So he called the name of the well, it's pronounced Asix. Because they quarreled with him. Stay right there. Don't be surprised when you and I begin to dig into the well of the word that things won't begin to change. When water starts flowing out of the word of God and life begins, revelation of the word begins to to come up in your life and you see things differently than you have before. That contention won't arise. Don't be surprised when there's not contention between you and maybe family members when you begin to see the word a little further, a little deeper than you did before. And you say, you know what, maybe the traditions that we always just sat and believed because somebody told us this, I'm reading this word myself and it does not say that and does not mean this. I begin to study this out and how many know contention will rise? Contention will arise from people who are dwelling in a dry place. Because they've gotten so used to the dry place that there's a contention for that water. And and it's not that they're mad at you or, or necessarily jealous. Some of them were jealous. But at the same time, they want what you got. They want a drink of that because why? Because as they begin to drink, how many know water in a dry place in a famine was life? And as you and I dig into the Word of God and the Word begins to illuminate in our life and we begin to understand it and it comes alive and it gives us strength and we start to feed on that Word, people will contend for it and they'll say, I want some of that. Don't be discouraged by that. Be excited by that. Don't get offended when somebody steals your notes if you're a preacher and goes and preaches them somewhere. That's the best compliment you could ever get. Amen? Because it's still the water of the word. It's still the, 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 the life-giving word. And if somebody wants that and tries to share that, so what if they try to claim it for themselves? It doesn't matter. It's the word. It's the seed. And it will still produce fruit. Amen? Because we're all on the same team. We all got the same daddy. Don't be surprised if there's not some contention in your life. When you start getting hungry for the word... You start getting in the Word and reading, studying. You're not only going to see and understand things, but it will cause others who are in Gerar and dry places to contend with you. I've heard people say when I, I've been around people that begin to grow and get into the Word, and God begin to speak to them or He would give them a word in a situation. And people looking from the outside don't understand it. And they got an opinion on what you ought to do or what you ought to say in that particular part of your life or that time in your life where you're living and you're in the Word and God spoke to you something and you're declaring what God said and you're excited about that and they get, they get nervous. And I've had them come to me and say, man, my family, they're kind of they're worried for me because I'm, I'm believing this grace stuff. They're kind of concerned because I, 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 this stuff makes sense to me and they're afraid that I'm, and they'll, they'll begin to say things to you like, be careful, sister. Be careful, brother, don't get too deep into that word because you could be led astray, you know, the Bible says. that Even the very elect will be led astray. That's not what it says. It said if it were possible, the very elect would be led astray. Amen? How many know you can't get too deep in the word and get too screwed up? It's the word of God. Amen? So that's crazy. But here's the deal. As you and I redig the well of the word and there could be contention show up, either from people who don't, want to grow and get better or people who just want you to dig it out and then they'll steal it or take it. It's all right. Amen. The good news is there's water. How many ever been around and and lived around a group of people or had a group of friends in your life? We talked about our friends list recently here and the people that you run with normally and you live life a certain way and you do certain things and then all of a sudden you start wanting to get better. You start wanting to go further. Maybe you want to get a little more education. Maybe you want to start getting healthier. 
Maybe you want to start doing some things different and go further than the, the group that you ran with. How many have ever dealt with the contention that rises and the, and the teasing or the whatever it is that they get on to you about? Oh, yeah, I forgot. You're going to be Miss Healthy now. And they contend. They make fun of you or whatever it is. It, it's that principal thing. That's just the way it is. Any time that you and I begin to grow and to get better or try to increase in something, there will be contention. But just because there's contention doesn't mean we stop and die there. And it doesn't mean we stay there. Come on. Keep drinking. Keep gaining. Keep growing. Keep, keep getting better at whatever it is that he's leading you to do, especially in the Word of God. But the good news is that well is water. And no matter what and who drinks it, it gives life. The next verse says, The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of it Asics because they quarreled with him. And then they did what? Said, No problem. Little contention. A little jealousy maybe. Somebody try to steal some of what I'm doing. Try to steal my idea, get my diet plan, get whatever it is I'm doing in my life, my exercise routine, my <laughs> eating liver, uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. You can't blame them for wanting to get better, can you? Amen. Don't let that distract you. Don't let it stop you. Don't let you don't stay there till you die. Tell your neighbor just dig another well. And we're going to get on well number two. Well number one is the word. I'm going to go to well number two, and I'll let you out of here in a few more minutes. They dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. Imagine that. I just got through this step, and y'all made fun of me and, and, and teased me and tried to pull me back down like the monkeys up the pole story. You all heard that one? And any time you try to get better, they try to pull you back. And I got to there, and I'm like, that's all right. Go ahead and get you some of that. I'm going to dig another well. And you go to dig another well, and lo and behold, Somebody didn't like that either. They contended, they, they contended for that too. But did he change the name of anything? Did he call it anything different than what it was? He said, no, my father's been here before me. My God has went before me, and he has provided a way. Your Bible says that he's already prepared a way. He has already provided for you and I. Your heavenly father, just like father Abraham in this story, has already been there. He's already got a well for you and I to drink from, and he just wants us to clean it back out and dig it back out. They dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also, so he called its name Sitna. Sitna. King James says it like this, they digged another well. Everybody say that. They digged another well. Say, dig another well. Dig another well. Well, number two. Number one was the word. Number two, I'm going to call the well of worship. The well of worship. How many know whoever has water in a dry place are the ones that make it? In this dry time, in this dry season in life, maybe in America, if you want to look at it like that, or, or in the... In, in your spiritual walk with God, in your relationship, in your finances, in this time, whoever's got the water makes it. Amen? The ones who thrive in a dry place are the people who have the water. That's why I'm on you. That's why God is on us to dig another well. Because if you're in a dry place, the water in the well is already there. We just need to dig it back out. Amen? We need to get back to some foundational things. We need to get back to the Word, and we need to get back to number two, worship. Verse 21 says, They dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. And I want to, I, I don't feel like I can get across the way I want to, the, the weightiness of what God spoke to me lately. The church, if you look back, the church goes through cycle as a whole, cycles. And, and watch this with me and see if it doesn't make sense. I just talked about, this is, there's no accident that I'm on this on Reformation Sunday. Where we are looking back at the Reformation of the church. When somebody had the guts and the revelation of a word to walk up and nail a thesis on the front door of the Catholic Church and say, the just shall live by faith. This is not about what we used to think it was about anymore. It's about faith. Amen. And we're on this very Sunday, and we're on this part of the Word, and God reminded me of how the church goes through these cycles, just like a believer can go through cycles in our life. We, we, we have good times, we have bad times. How many know there's four seasons in our weather patterns in, in, in life? It's the way it is. 
But we go through them just like in this story. And if you look back every time in church history that there was a new revelation of the Word, the different movements from Luther the faith movements, the apostolic movements, the, the, the worship movement. I'll get into that in a minute. Different movements. We call them movements, but what they really came out of was a revelation of the Word. Somebody really saw something in the Word of God, and it was a truth. Nothing wrong with any of it until we took it too far at different places and ways, and we perverted it, but there was nothing wrong with that movement. I, I think back when... when the guys started the tent revivals and the faith movement. When that thing begun and so many people's lives were changed because they got a hold of faith and how we speak and declare life in faith in what the Word says and what God has said to us. How I many know there's really nothing wrong with that? Nothing wrong with it at all. It was a good thing. And, and the church would go through these movements because of a revelation of the Word and it would cause contention. Every time there was a move of God, every time there was a, a, a revelation of the Word of God, it would cause contention. But that didn't mean we stopped. Amen? There were people that began to drink out of that well and realize, hey, this is water in a dry place. And I am going to move forward in my understanding. I'm going to move forward in my walk with God. I'm not going to just have the whole concept of, you know, this whole Christianity thing is about praying a prayer and asking Jesus into my life and then live a, a poor, wretched, miserable life for 50, 60, 70 years and then I'll die and get out of here and it'll all be good. Maybe there's more to this. I mean, that's a revelation in itself right there. And you take a step and it causes contention. It's like, why don't you just come back here and just go to church and go through the motions like we do and quit all this holy stuff and trying to go... And you, anybody been there? It's the same way as a whole with the church. Every time there was a revelation, there was contention. But some people kept drinking from that well and moving forward. But with that next thing that happened was usually, not far behind it, a change in worship. Think back with me, some of you older people that have seen things in your life or you, you understand church history a little bit. Not only with the revelation of the Word of God, but the worship evolves or changes or moves. Because how many know that when you get a revelation of the Word of God, it changes the way you worship? I don't see God the way I used to see God anymore. So I went from an old slave mentality worship type song of someday I'm going to get out of here and it'll all be better after a while to where I got a hold of kingdom stuff and that he has a life for me here and now and I quit singing about when I get out of here and I start declaring who he is and I start declaring what he's going to do in my worship. My, my song changes. You can even see it all through Scripture when you talk about Moses' song, Mary's song, and the songs of these people in Scripture. As their revelation of the Word changes and grows, their worship changes and grows. Does that make sense? And if you look back at worship in the church, it's the same thing. The revelation of the Word comes, there's contention. Worship changes, and how many know there's contention when you change the music? Come on. When we changed from the books to singing off the wall, there was contention. But what difference does it make if you're looking at a book like this and reading the words and singing a song, or you're looking on the wall like this and singing a song? If you're singing the same songs, let's just stay in the same songs. What's it really matter? It's in print here or here. At least we're looking up a little further when we're singing to God. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just, are you with me with this? The revelation of the word, there's contention. Don't stop. Keep drinking the water. <laughs> the, the worship begins to change and grow or evolve and, and do something. Don't stop because your worship has to change according to your revelation of him. Does that make sense? Your song will change. That's why it talks about in scripture, sing a new song. I wish Cassie would sing that today. She wrote a song called Sing a New Song of Who I Am. We'll quit singing of, uh, of, the, of the way life is and how bad everything is. And we change as our revelation of the Word of God. We change and we start singing a song of how great is our God. Sing with me. Sing with me how great. Why did we come up with that song? 
Because we realize greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. And I'm not going to focus bent over like the woman that was bent over for all those years. And Jesus, what did he say to her? Lift up your head and be ye lifted up. Why? Because your redemption draweth nigh. He's God. He's here. He's already defeated. That's a revelation. It's finished work. Wait a minute. He's already beat the devil. He's not coming back. Did he halfway do it? Did he kind of do it? Did he? Well, I tied him up, and then I'm going to let him loose, and then I'll come back and really whip him later. What part of it is it fin- it's finished did we not get? And all of a sudden, you start thinking, man, that does kind of make sense. And then, so you, you dig in that word, and then somebody says, be careful, brother. You know, all those 47 books we bought, those guys couldn't have been wrong. And you're going, well, wait a minute, I was reading the Bible, and the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. Well, I know, but brother so-and-so probably knows more than you. He's got an education. <laughs> I just stepped in it. There is no better revelation than you and I will get than by the Holy Spirit of God of the Word of God. Amen? I'm all for education. I'm all for learning and teaching. And education. I told you about my education that I used to tell people, and I, and I went up to a certain time of all those people that I listened to, and then I hit a Gerard. I wore myself slap out in ministry. We gave. We did. We did all this stuff. I was going to serve God, and I was doing all this works, works, works. And then I go through a Gerard. And all of a sudden, that word ain't working no more because it was limited on the revelation. And it was limited on my understanding. And so what happened to me is I step out in faith and I begin to follow God. And he says, I want you to fast for seven days and and, uh, stay in your garage and read your Bible. I begin to dig in the well of the word because that well I'd been drinking from had gotten filled up. It wasn't, it wasn't deep enough, wasn't enough water there. And so I began to dig in that word, and all of a sudden the word started becoming alive, and I started having questions. And it's like, well, wait a minute. They always taught us this, but it says this. How come nobody talked about this part? And you've heard me say it, the simplest of forms. They always told us there was two of every animal on the ark. Who agrees with that? That's not true. That's not all of it. There were seven of some kinds of animals on the ark. That was one of the first simplest things I said I I found in Scripture as I began to read the Bible for myself. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why is there seven of some? Why is that? It's got to be important. It's in the Word. Come on. And so then I begin to... I begin to to see things, and the Holy Spirit's revealing things to me, and He's saying things I've never heard anybody say before, and I'm thinking, I'm crazy. I've lost my mind, but man, my spirit, my baby's just doing flip-flops in me. I know this is right. And then I can prove it like six different places in Scripture. It's not like it's just one thing and I twisted it. No, I didn't twist anything. It says it. And then I found it over here and over here and over here and over here. And so I go through that contention part. And then I begin to run into guys like Lynn Hiles, Paul White. Different guys like that, that and, and you begin to understand the word more and more, and then this thing starts making sense. And all of a sudden, I couldn't sing the old worship songs I used to sing anymore because we used to have revival, and we'd sing for hours. I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me. How many know that's not biblical? I don't need to go back to the enemy's camp. He stole nothing from me. God took it all from him. My Bible says that he rendered him. Amen? He defeated him. He made a show of him openly. I don't need to go take nothing. Everything, it's mine. I I couldn't sing those old songs anymore. I couldn't sing that. My worship began to change to where I began to sing a new song of who he is and faith and love and that he's he's already finished stuff and it's, it's ours for the taking. Go in and take the land. Amen? And when I die, I'll go to heaven someday. That's great. But I'm going to live the here and now, now. I don't want to get off track, but I'm getting off track. What happened in the church is the worship began to change too. The well of worship, there's been contention with that and change every time. And in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of revelation of the Word of God. I don't deny that one bit, and I'm not against that. How many know that the Word of God is more accessible now than ever before in history? I think about the old guys that used to just have a King James Bible, and that's all they had. 
to preach the word of God. They couldn't look up and see meanings of words and what it was in Greek and Hebrew and Latin and, and the 14 thousand different translations of it and why they translated this and that and what church did this and that they just had a bible and the holy ghost amen and they got us so far and i'm not i'm not against that by any means but in the last 20 years there's been a lot of revelation of the word it's more accessible than ever before from apps to the best teachers and leaders that you can you can access anywhere in the world at the click of a button in your hand on your phones so why is there such a dryness? Why is it so dry? Why is it this way right now? Why are people so depressed and messed up because the economy went bad or because we don't know what's going on in Washington or this kind of stuff? It's the same way with worship. Worship has changed and moved along with this revelation of the Word of God in a good way, and I'm not taking, taking a, a shot at that either. But God said to me, it's time to remind the people not to get distracted with worshiping, now hear me, hear what I say, write this down. With worshiping the revelation of the word and forgetting who the word really is. You can get into, you can get into circles and, and people get so caught up with finding a new revelation in the word that they're so caught up in that revelation of I found something or I made a neat point or look how we tied this together that we missed the point that that whole thing keeps pointing to him. Amen. And we, if we're going to reveal the word and we're going to get into the revelation of the word, it needs to always end up pointing to Jesus. Amen. It needs to always come back to not me and look how great I am and how smart of a deep teacher I am. It needs to come back to look how awesome my God is. Look at what he did. Look at this. See him this way. Look at this picture. Come over here and get this angle. Look at that. I mean, does that make sense? That's what we need to not worship the revelation, but we need to remember and, uh, that well of the word and who it really is. Second part of that is he said to me, he said, do not get distracted with worshiping worship and forget who we're worshiping because you can get on some awesome worship stuff on apps and YouTube. Amen. There's some good stuff, good music, nice lights, nice smoke, great outfits, perfect sound, move you. Nothing wrong with worshiping God and ain't nothing wrong with being professional. Amen? But let's not get distracted by that and think because we don't have that in my car or we don't have that at our church or we don't have that in this, that we don't have worship. See what I'm saying? Don't worship the worship. Worship Him. When you're digging the well of worship, don't get distracted with worshiping worship. I had somebody tell me that. Years ago, when the worship movement just really got big after about the mid-90s into the early 2000s, and everybody began to really get into this worship movement and, and uh, the kind of music, and they thought if we sang songs from the Brownsville Revival at our church, it'd bring revival to our church and, and all that kind of stuff. And people got into it. And I had a guy say to me one day, he said, you know, you need to be careful not to worship worship. And I thought, that's pretty good. Because we could just get so caught up in the music or we could get so caught up in, in, in doing something popular or making it sound just right or the drums hitting just right or guitars that we miss worshiping God. This is about you. And how many know worship is not just music? Worship is a lifestyle. Digging the well of worship is not just playing music. And having a quiet time with God, although I do believe it is that in some senses. Help me preach this in just a minute. I'll finish it. I'm saying when you and I get in the well of the word, there'll be contention in Gerard, but don't stay there like Abraham's father and die. Dig another well. It's called worship. And call it what God calls it, true worship. Not the music, not the movement, but him. The result of digging a well of worship is so powerful, there's no way to really describe it. Stuff happens in times of worship that lasts forever and changes generations. God will speak to you. The Bible says that He inhabits the praises of His people. That's where He dwells. He manifests Himself in the praises of His people. That's why we do worship here. 
We worship to forget about everything else that's going on and to focus in on Him and, and, and corporately come together to worship Him, knowing that He's dwelling in His presence and we, that His Spirit manifests more and more. And as His Spirit manifests, what does the Holy Spirit do? It reminds us of the Word. God speaks to us in those times. Have you ever had God speak to you during a time of worship that changed the direction of your life? I have, and you should. Not because I did, because it's in the Word. A time of worship is when God speaks, and He speaks, and it changes the trajectory of your life and your children or what you do. You do something in accordance to the Word of God, like Abraham, obeying whatever God said, because during a time of worship, God shows up. God reveals Himself. He speaks, and you do something. One of the things that becomes so real to me again lately is the generational blessings from Abraham. God would say to Isaac and Jacob, I'm doing this because of what Abraham did. If you study David, King David, the same thing for him. For hundreds of years, you can go through Scripture and you'll find another place where it says, chapters later in the Bible where it says, but for my servant David's sake, I'm doing this. Matter of fact, he told one guy, he said, I, I should have killed you. Matter of fact, I would have killed you. But for my servant David's sake, I'm doing this. Your great, 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 great granddad, granddad. Don't tell me God doesn't do those kinds of things. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. I'm becoming more and more aware of the reason why God didn't kill me. It wasn't because of what I did. It's because of what somebody else did. Amen? It's what somebody else prayed over me. It's because of what somebody else did on a cross 2,000 years ago that he doesn't do that. Amen? They that worship, the Bible says, must worship in spirit and in truth. You can't fake worship. True worship has to be in spirit and in truth. It reminds me of Mary Magdalene. You all know that story. When she comes in while all the others are supposed to be having a time with Jesus, they're having a cell group. They got the living word sitting right in front of them. He's revealing scripture. Oh, and all of a sudden, here comes the town harlot, the one they all talk about. She comes walking in the room, and they begin to whisper, hey, what, what's she doing in our church? You know, I've had people come up to me and ask me, did you see so-and-so was here Sunday? I said, yeah. They said, what are they doing here? That's when I almost lose my victory. All of a sudden, I feel my fist double or my hand open up for a full arm slap. And I smile and I grit my teeth and I say, the same thing you're doing here. You know why Mary was there? She had a revelation of the word. Somewhere she realized, wait a minute, here's the truth. And while they're all in there sitting around in their pious positions, trying to decide who's closer to Jesus or whatever they're deciding, or the religious guys just contending with his word or whatever they're doing, here comes Mary Magdalene and she comes in and the Bible says that she breaks open an alabaster box. She breaks open the perfume and she begins to worship. Why? Because she had a revelation of the word and then she saw the worship and her worship changed. And she said, now everything that was so valuable to me is nothing. I break it over his feet. And she breaks it over his feet and she begins to wash his feet and dries them with her hair. And the contention rises again. If he knew who that was. And Jesus knowing their thoughts. Tell your neighbor Jesus always knows your thoughts. Just because you didn't say it doesn't mean he didn't know it. Oh, come on. Let's get real. He says, you know. 
And I'm going to shorten the story up for, for time. Y'all didn't do anything for me. And she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I got here, since she got here. She broke that perfume over my feet. She's anointing me. One person said, well, we could have sold that perfume. Eerie. We could have bought another church van. We could have done something else. Jesus said, well, let me tell you what. You see this woman? Wherever the gospel is preached from now on. Everybody say now on. Remember, that means it didn't stop. I'm preaching it right here today, 2,000 plus years later. Wherever it's preached, she'll be talked about. She'll be preached. Why? Because your worship is important. Realizing who he is and the value of who he is and the value of that word, your worship is important. And your story, whether it's preached or not, it's going to be lived out through your generations. What your kids see you put value in will have the lasting effect more than anything else. She digs a well. It cost her, but it was nothing compared to being in his presence. What worship does when we, whether it's worshiping and having quiet time with music or just having music on or that, or it's giving when he tells us to give, that's a form of worship. Whatever it is, that's a form. Because why? <laughs> the very word worship can be translated worthship. What's most valuable? To her, here was something very valuable. Could you imagine how valuable perfume was in her line of work? Don't let me offend you. A year's worth of wages. That's how valuable that was in a monetary sense. But could you imagine how valuable that was to her in her line of work? She says it's worth nothing compared to him. Worthship. What is most valuable to I? Do you and I? That's. I'm not here to make a guilt trip this morning. I'm here to get it right and tell the truth because I've had to go through it too. Worship is not just singing. It can be several things. The word actually can be defined as worthship. Whatever is most valuable to you is where your heart is. That's your Bible says that. Your treasure is where your heart is. Your treasure, the most valuable part, is where your heart is at. We need to check our hearts on our worship and what's most valuable to us. I was driving down the road the other day, and I heard this in my, in my spirit, in my mind, however you want to say it. Time is the most valuable thing you have. What did you do with it? What did I do with the time that I had? And then I'm going to go one step further. You can get your phone out just like I can. And you can look at how many hours and minutes you spend a week on social media in other wells, so to speak, that aren't really wells, TikTok, and every other app. And compare that to the time that you spend in the Word and the time that you spend in the well of worship. Stand with me if you would. You want out of a dry place? Check your phone. You want out of a dry place? Dig the well of the word and redig the well, redig the well of the word, redig the well of worship. Where is the most where the most value is is where your heart is, your treasure is where your heart is. You may be at a place in Gerar, a dry place. This applies even to relationships. Hear me. I feel the contention in the room because I'm speaking truth. Even in our relationships, why are they dry? What are we spending the most time on? We have to be honest. 
At some point, I, I told Cassie that this is this week. I said, at some point in whatever the problem is in the situation that we're going through in our life, we have to say the same things the disciples said to Jesus. Is it I? Is it I? That's not to beat you up. Jesus wasn't there he, to beat any of them up. He just stated, a matter of fact, matter of fact, one of you is going to betray me. Don't be like Judas. And try to redeem yourself because you can't. Don't take this as a guilt trip this morning. Take it as a revelation that God's speaking to you and he loves you so much he don't want you to miss out on what he has for you. Take it as an understanding that he's crying out. He's wanting us to redig the wells of life, of the word and worship and the power of those two wells and the life bringing source that, that is to you and I and how much more life we will have in drinking from those wells as the other wells we're drinking. Amen. You may be in a dry place like Gerard and don't feel like your heart's in it. I get that. I've been there too. There's times I've said, I don't ever want to go back to that place. I'm done. People ain't listening to me. They ain't changing. They don't care. Where was my focus? This way. And on my opinion and what I could see, instead of getting my focus back where it needs to be, spending my time in the Word, and then I got this revelation to where everything in my life is not as valuable as him anymore. And now my worship, my time is all spent with him. And I get back to where it started, to where if people are the only thing eternal, why do I want to spend my whole life on anything but people? And all that goes away again. And I come back up here and I want to preach. Or I want to love people. I want to be with people. God is calling all of us back to redig the wells that our faith used to drink from and that gave us life. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning, and I want you to, those of you that are in a situation, ladies, would you mind to come up here to sing? Those of you that feel like you're in a dry situation, Gerard, or whatever it is in your life, whatever type of situation it is, and I just want you to check yourself. I want you to say, God, is it I? Is there an area in my life that I've allowed the enemy to just fill dirt in that well? And you'll know. You probably already knew. It's not a problem. He's here with grace today. He's here with mercy today. Matter of fact, His grace is the thing that showed up today to remind you, hey, you got dirt in your well. Just dig it out. Just throw out that other stuff that you've allowed to get more important and start drinking from that well that you used to drink from again, that your father dug for you. And life will come right back. And you'll continue to prosper. And you're going to fulfill everything that I said you were going to fulfill in your life. It's all good. Amen. That ought to jerk a praise up out of all of us right here, right now. God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. When I allowed too much time and other things and the distractions to take away from me. And then I, I wondered why things got dry. Thank you because you love me enough to just show me and say the well's still there. Yeah. Just redig it. Just redig it. Father, help us, I pray, to realize the life that you have. Man, you've got a life for us. Generational blessing. The blessing of the Father. You're going to reveal that to us. Man, this is not a hard thing. This is a good thing that we ought to be so excited and just be yelling at people around us. Give me the shovel. Give me the shovel. Give me the shovel. Let me dig. Let me dig. Let me dig. Thank you for the life of your word, the truth of it. It changes us, rearranges us. 
your grace and your mercy. We just give you praise today. If you agree with me, say amen. Amen. Thank you for those of you that joined us online. We appreciate you and we pray that God speaks to you. Send us a message. Let us know where you're from. Prayer requests. We'll pray with you. Whatever we can do to help you. God bless you. I pray you have a great week. Goes for the rest of you too. Amen.